So today's video is partially sponsored by our friend of the channel, Mushroom Guy. Now, Mushroom Guy offered to sponsor today's tutorial. He wanted to know if there's a good way to do a glow effect, but when painted by hand. Now, those of you who have seen the channel and have seen some of my previous content, you know I oftentimes like to cheat when doing my glow effects, and I tend to use my airbrush quite a lot. In fact, I tend to use it as a crutch. However, today's video, we're going to put all that aside, and we're going to put this out in the open, and we are going to compare once and for all the glow effect done by hand versus a glow effect done with an airbrush. Now, these are the two ways that I have learned how to do it. This is my preferred method with an airbrush versus my preferred method by hand. And we're going to see the two here on screen, and I'm going to show you how I got there. Real quick before we get started, these are two display plinths for a much larger project. This commission was just to paint the plinths and to make this tutorial. So moving on to some of the colors that I'll be using, I'm going to be using a method known as leopard spotting today. And we're going to use Seraphim Sepia, Fusion Orange, Ethonian Camo Shade, Nuln Oil, and Agrax Earth Shade. And together, uh, that combination of colors is going to create what's known as leopard spotting and it's going to give a really realistic stone effect. Now we're going to stick with our Seraphim Sepia, our Fugan Orange, and our Ethonian Camo Shade to begin with and that's going to do our initial spots and then the Nuln Oil and the Agrax Earth Shade is going to get used all over. So let's move right into it and get on with this. Now it doesn't really matter if you start out with the Seraphim Sepia or the Fugan Orange, you want this yellowy brown or a yellowy orange color and we're just kind of spotting it all over. You can see I'm not really going for any kind of real coverage here. We just kind of want to get some color on the model in a haphazard stippling motion. What this is going to do is it's going to go ahead and it's going to start setting up the layers so that as we continue to add more colors on top of this, it'll all kind of blend together and you'll get a big depth of colors from this yellow all the way up through even our black later on down the road. So regardless of whether you started with your yellow brown color or you went with that orangey yellow fugan orange color, we want to move to the opposite color now. So once that first layer dries, go ahead and do the same thing, kind of do this spotty approach and kind of just dab it on all over the same way that we did with our first layer. Do that with your second layer as well. Hold off on using the Ethonian camo shade as the Ethonian camo shade is really great for kind of doing like moss and algae and things like that. And you want it to be your last step because you don't want it to be filtered through all the other colors. Now moving on to Agrax Earthshade, the first step we want to do is different from the previous one. We want to go ahead and we want to wet the surface. We want to cover the surface with water. And what this is going to do is we're essentially going to be wet blending between our Agrax Earthshade and we're going to be wet blending between the water. And what that's going to do is it's basically going to allow the color to soak into all the nooks and crevices, but also to flow across the surface and almost give a coffee stained appearance. We oftentimes when painting try to stay away from that coffee staining look because it doesn't quite look right. However, when you're doing rock faces like this or stone, that coffee staining effect tends to actually help us and make things look more natural. Moving on to our non oil, you can just do a basic black wash with this, just some black paint and a lot of water, one part paint to 10 parts water. Go ahead and wet the surface down again before we go ahead and put this black wash on again. We aren't trying to stain the entirety of the surface. We're trying to get more of a coffee stained appearance. So by wetting it down with water first and then putting our wash on top, it's going to flow into the cracks. It's going to stay off the high spots and it's going to give us more of a coffee stained appearance. And so when we go to do our dry brushing in the next stage, things are going to look more realistic. Now depending on how old you want this to look, your stone can either have this final stage done now or it can have it done after the dry brushing. For this, I didn't want it to look super old and super aged, so we're going to go ahead and do that exact same step, put water over everything, and then this time when we apply our Thonian Camo Shade, we're not putting it all over, we're just going to spot it in places, maybe cover one singular whole panel, but for the most part we're stippling with the wash. You can see we're not using tons of this stuff, we're just putting it in a few places, and then we're letting it wash. Now I have gone heavy on a few spots, 
and I have gone really light on the other plinth and you'll see at the end that it doesn't make a huge difference. That green is still there but it's not overwhelming. So whether you go heavy fisted like I am here or not, doesn't really matter. If you think you've done too much, you can always dab at it with a paper towel. Don't wipe, just dab. If you wipe, you're going to leave streaks and it's going to ruin some of the layers below it as well. So just dab if you want to remove any places where it's pooling or puddling too much. Now there are three colors that I tend to use when dry brushing stone, two of which are the most prevalent is a khaki color and a gray color. Sometimes I like to add white to a little bit of either or, meaning a little white to my khaki or a little white to my gray, but I try not to go too overboard. I try not to add too many colors, especially with dry brushing because you'll end up with a situation where you just really can't see the differences in the colors. So traditionally with a dry brush, we wanna just go ahead and mush it into the bristles and then try to get the majority of it off. However, for large stone pieces like this, I don't get 100% of the paint off. I get it to about 80%. And then I like to do this little streaky method where you can kind of stipple and drag the brush. This is going to give the illusion of scrapes and scratches and it's really going to help with the final appearance once we put all of our dry brushing in. It's going to blend all those harsh lines together but in the few places where you still have harsh lines, it's going to give the illusion that something has been dragged across the surface and scraped. Now you may want to repeat this step when all is said and done to add some more deliberate scrape marks but for the most part we just want to do this here. Now let's talk about when we go to add in our khaki. We want to be a little bit more careful about adding our khaki color in as well as going maybe a little hem fisted with our gray. But for the most part with our khaki color we're using it to pick out specific stones. So as you can see here I'm trying not to put too much of the same color all right next to each other but I am going a little ham fisted with the dry brush and I'm doing this so that I can change the tint and color of the whole surface without ruining all those washes that we just put on it. Now you can see here, you can see where I've picked out some of these and you can really see how the colors pop and how that fugan orange plays through and this is an example. So the one on the left, I've done no dry brushing to. You can see exactly what it looks like when the washes are done versus once you put all of your dry brushing on and how it really brings those stone gray kind of tones back into everything. But you can still see all of those colors that fugan orange, the Ethonian camo shade, the browns and the blacks, it's all still there. And you can even see some of those sharp drag marks where it looks like the surface of the stone has maybe had something dragged across it. There's even all those little marks still there. This is one of my favorite ways of doing stone and I even replicate it as best as I can for smaller stuff. And you can go around the outside edge and anywhere where you've not gotten it quite perfect, you can kind of blend it in with a little bit of khaki. And it does a really great job at kind of blending the whole thing together. So if you've seen some of my tips for beginner videos, you'll know that I like to refer to as a trifecta of color. You want a dark, a mid-tone, and a light. There's a lot of different glowing effects such as light from a flashlight versus something more on the ethereal side of things like magic. So when I do my magic type glow, I try to stick to a minimum of three colors, which gets you this super vibrant high tone and this really dark, saturated low tone. And so we want to work with these three colors. We want to work within the trifecta, similar to how I try to encourage new painters to paint. So the bulk of the glow effect is going to be coming from our mid-tone, in this case that almost sky blue color. That is going to be our mid-tone, it's going to do most of our work. Our high tone, which is that rust gray, that really bright blue gray, that is going to be our highlight. And then our dark tones, which is going to help to darken everything down and be our deepest recesses, is that cantor blue. Not all that dissimilar from a dry brush method, we want to be working with minimal paint on our brush and we're going to be using a mixture of dry brushing and stippling. Now we're using stippling to help feather out the edges of our glow. This is going to help to blend it in with the surrounding surfaces and not give us super dark, harsh lines. We really don't want any straight lines. We kind of want to have it feathered. And you could dry brush this, but with as flat as the surface is, I find that stippling works best. And so now you can see here, this is what the whole thing is gonna look like. It is time consuming, that's why we did this jump cut here but we just want to go ahead and any places where you've got some harsh lines, then you can start to use your dry brushing and try to blend things out, blend all the way down into your edges, but just kind of get the basic shapes on there first and then worry about blending out all your lines. 
Now this is going to feel weird putting a dark tone on top of a much brighter tone. So we want to go ahead and we want to take our deepest, darkest tones and we want to do our best to place it in the recesses. However, I highly recommend that you water this down into a wash and do multiple coats and build up to a point where you're happy. I ended up using two thin coats and that was more than enough for me. Then we want to come in with our high tone, our rust gray, and we want to use this almost like a pinstripe. So you want to put a little bit more water or thinner into this than what you would normally do when thinning your paint so it flows off the brush easier. However, we do not want to turn this into a wash and we do not want it to glaze. We just want it to f have a really nice flowing consistency and that takes a little bit of practice. But essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and we're gonna pinstripe right down the middle of all these cracks. And we're gonna leave a little bit of that dark blue on either side. And we're gonna leave all of that nice bright blue on the outside edge of the cracks and our highest blue right in the dead center. And one of the really cool things you can do is you can blend out in places and create what I call hot spots, which are just places where it's at its brightest. So in the middle of all the cracks, we wanna fill up all those conjoining places where all those cracks are meeting together and fill that up and make a bright spot and anywhere where those cracks are leaving the edge of the plinth we can also create a bright spot there and kind of help blend everything together one of the really cool things about this effect is although it is time consuming it is very rewarding so if there's a point where you feel like you need to maybe add a little bit more of that dark blue back in you can do that um, as long as you've not gone crazy overboard by adding your super bright blue it should be fine there should be basically a little thin edge of that darkest blue along both sides of your super bright blue and that's how you know you've done it right as you finish the effect it's really going to start kind of messing with your eyes and you're going to feel as though maybe you've almost painted it with metallic paint or at least it messes with my eyes in that way uh, you can also go back in and you can dry brush that super bright blue on again in places where you may have gone a little heavy fisted and gotten it up on those raised edges but for the most part you want to be really careful with that because as you can see you'll just end up covering up spots and you'll have to fix it again with that super bright blue anyway so just take your time go slow do it right the first time because fixing this can be a real pain in the butt sometimes now I have zero intention on showing you guys exactly how I'm doing this on the airbrush because I have done that a bajillion times. Anytime you watch one of my videos and I do a glow effect, I am literally putting the exact same color of paint through the airbrush. It's literally just the number of layers I put on to build up its thickness so that you give the illusion of a really bright color versus a really saturated dark color. So here you go guys, this is the airbrushed green on the right and the painted by hand blue on the left. Which one is your favorite? Personally, I feel like they both have their own place. I feel like the airbrush definitely works really well for certain effects, whereas I feel like if you're going to do almost ethereal glow effects, a lot of times the best way to do them is by hand because of the depth of color and the control that you have over your highlights. However, they definitely both have their places. The airbrush one is definitely much faster, and if you're under time constraints, go with the airbrush if you have it as an available option. But as you can see, you can do this with both an airbrush and a traditional brush. But I'm very interested in seeing what you guys have to say about it below. So I'm really interested in knowing down below what you guys think. Uh, did you like the blue one? I personally really like the blue one, or did you like the green one? Uh, the green one definitely has its choices on when you should be using it, like I keep saying. However, I feel like if you combine the two, you would save time while still getting a similar effect. And that's probably what I'll end up doing in the future if I have the time. But I'm really interested in knowing, again, like I keep saying, what do you guys think down below? As well as if you have any ideas on future episodes, feel free to leave those in the comments because you guys do help inspire future episodes from time to time. You guys have some really, really awesome ideas and I can't wait to see what you guys say about this. So as always, I hope your display case is always filled and your pile of shame never runs empty. Until next time.